So, uh, the topic for my lectures is QCD and collider physics. Um, um, this is obviously a huge subject, and I, I can only do a very little of it. Um, I think some of the collider physics aspects are a little bit easier. Um, uh, they're kind of simpler and, and more general things. QCD, I mean, you could study QCD for 10 years and still not understand it, I mean, as I have. Uh, so I'll do my best to introduce some, some elements of QCD directly relevant to, to colliders, um, and, uh, you know, we can see how that goes. Um, uh, I'm a little unsure of your background. Uh, do you all under, do you know, have you taken a course on quantum field theory? Has anyone not seen quantum field theory? They should have. They should have. Well, <laughs> doesn't mean they have. Um, uh, and uh, have you seen QCD, the quantum chromodynamics? Started in your course, yeah? Okay, some elementary level. Okay, so um, I want to make sure everyone's on the same page, so when I start getting up to QCD, uh, I'll, I'll review the relevant material and then try to give you a different perspective on things that you may have learned in your, in your courses and, and, and talk about some things that I think are interesting and different, maybe more physical ways to think about um, aspects of QCD. Um, so there's five lectures. Uh, roughly the topics are, the first lecture is going to be on collider physics. Maybe, and the LHC. And certainly the LHC is the motivation for thinking about collider physics these days. Um, uh, th the, second, um, the second lecture I plan to talk more about the standard model. I noticed that there's no, there's no other lecturer talking about the standard model here. It's mostly um, you know, a variety of topics in theoretical physics. Um, and uh, so there's, you know, there's no talks about electric weak physics or Higgs physics. I mean, there's, you'll see his talks on um, flavor physics, but that's really quite complementary to the stuff I'm going to talk about. So really, I'm going to talk about the standard model in the context of collider physics. Um, and uh, the third lecture will be, we'll start with QCD, so maybe um, intro to QCD. And then we'll talk about um, the parton model, by which I mean parton distribution functions, where they come from, and how to connect them to uh, QCD. Um, and then the fifth lecture, which will be next week, will be on jet physics. Um, let me write slash factorization. God, this chalk disappears immediately. Um, factorization. So factorization is the statement that you can perform a calculation relevant to a collider by separating it into parts. So you calculate something about the, the protons and then something about some kind of hard scattering, something about the radiation of the particles after they scatter, and then something about hadronization. And I'll try to give you a little bit of the theoretical foundation um, for factorization and connect it to the physics of jets, which is the stage of radiation, um, which are becoming an increasingly more important part of, of collider physics. Um, so that's roughly the outline, and I'm not sure these will all be, I'll, I'll be able to finish all of these in separate lectures, and we might merge into each other. Um, and I'm hoping you'll ask a lot of questions and kind of direct it, and I, I'm, help, I'm happy to go off on, on tangents and discuss things that are more interesting to you. Um, and I really do want this to be interactive, so it, you'll learn a lot more if you ask questions as we go along. Um, um, so that's the plan. Um, some references uh, are... Um, well, the first one is my book, my book, um, um, what's it called, Quantum Field Theory, and Standard Model by Schwartz. And this will, this will just, so all of the stuff I'm going to talk about here is contained in this, and some, and, and really a lot of this as well. Not so much collider physics. Um, collider physics, uh, an excellent reference is um, um, uh, what is it? Uh, um, the, what is it called? The, the pink book. <laughs> Let me try it this way. This is, um, I think it's called QCD and Collider Physics.
by um, uh, Campbell Sterling and Weber. Uh, so these are sort of classic references. Well, mine's not classic yet, but it will be. Um, and uh, the Pick Book is a good book if you're interested in cloud physics at all. It kind of has some of the basic formulas, the introduction to where things come from. Um, you know, it was, it was a book written in the 90s, so a lot of the stuff, is, some of it's a little out of date. It doesn't have modern collider physics topics in there, um, but it really is uh, uh, foundational and has a lot of information. Um, goes well beyond what I'm going to talk about here. Um, uh, there's also a lot of good lecture notes online, you know, TASI lectures and so on, um, that, uh, you know, if you want a particular topic, the, probably the best thing to do is just Google that topic um, and see what comes up and then track the references. I mean. That's what I do, um, and that's a good habit to get into, especially as you're, you're transitioning to doing research where um, things will not be covered in, in standard textbooks. Um, okay, so that's, that's the, uh, the introductory material. Uh, is this an eraser, or do I eat it? Yeah. The other one's, but this one? This is heavier, so it's probably not as good. Or maybe it is better. That's why it's heavier. Um, okay, I'm going to erase this. So let's start with um, the LHC. Um, well, let's start with, so what I'd like to do first is just a little bit of dimensional analysis, just get some numbers out there uh, so we can understand the design of the LHC and what it's trying to do and why it's built the way it is. Um, so let's start with the proton. The LHC collides protons. Uh, and anyone know how big a proton is? Small. Good. Can someone be more specific? Radius of femtobar. Okay, where, how do you know that? How do you know that? What are you basing that on? Well, okay, I mean, you're, you, so you remember that it's about a femtobar, a femtometer. Yeah, which is, which is correct. Um, what is a femtometer in electron volts? Anyone know how to convert between length and energy? Yeah. Hundreds, of Hundreds of MeV. Right, so that's a useful thing to remember. So one femtometer, which is 10 to the minus 15 meters, um, is around 200 MeV, which is also the scale lambda QCD. Um, it's the, the characteristic scale of hydrogenation. It's the characteristic scale where the strong coupling blows up and so on. Um, and it's the typical size of uh, strong interaction things. Uh, uh, how heavy is the proton? How much does it weigh? 1 GV. Okay. You guys know that. So 1 GV is five times heavier than that, right? So the proton's somewhat smaller than this characteristic size. So you should think of the, the proton. So here's the proton. It's roughly one femtometer wide. Um, um, and its mass is somewhat larger, so it corresponds to the, the um, Compton wavelength of the uh, proton is somewhat smaller, but it has this kind of larger cloud around it from QCD radiation. Um, uh, okay, so, uh, so what's the cross-sectional area of a proton? This is, this is an easy one. Centerpoint point squared. Right, so, so cross-section for the proton um, is just the cross-sectional area, say pi r squared, um, which is, you know, 3 times 10 to the minus uh, 30 uh, meters squared. Right, so this is, a, this is what you should remember. This is around, um, so this is, you know, uh, between 10 to the minus 29 and 10 to the minus 30 square meters is the typical size of, of a proton. Um, uh, now, we normally talk about cross sections in field theory in the units of barn. Who can tell me what a barn is in square meters? Ten to the minus twenty-eight. Excellent. So one barn is ten to the minus twenty-eight square meters. Um, so uh, the cross sectional area of a proton um, is around thirty millibarn. Um, which is a typical size. So, so it's, it's roughly a barn. It's slightly smaller than a barn. Um, but typically the unit barn corresponds roughly to the size that a proton is. 
Um, okay, so we're, so the LHC collides together these protons that are roughly a barn or uh, of 30 millibarns in cross section, um, and we're trying to make other things, right? So uh, what we'd like to do is collide them and produce something like um, a Higgs boson or a W boson. Uh, what's the cross section for uh, a W boson? What's the cross section for for um, just scattering to produce a W boson? Anyone know? Can anyone estimate it? Just kind of dimensional analysis. What's the characteristic scale associated with weak interactions? G Fermi. Okay, what's G Fermi? Anyone know what G Fermi is? Well, dimensional analysis again. What is the what is the only relevant scale here? W mass, right? So this is roughly one over a hundred GeV squared. Um, so if a hundred MeV is uh, in, uh, corresponds to a millibarn, hundred GeV squared is going to correspond to a factor of ten to the six. So ten to the this is ten to the minus three squared millibarn, um, which is roughly one picobarn. So picobarn is 10 to the minus, um, I'm sorry, nanobarn. Nanobarn, which is 10 to the minus uh, nine barns. Right, so what this says is um, about, so this is about a millionth of the, of the cross-section of a proton that says every time you collide a proton a million times, you expect to produce around one W boson, right? Now, that was, we had previous colliders whose goal was producing W bosons, you know, UA1 at CERN in particular, in their 80s was producing W bosons. Um, uh, so their goal was to be able to probe these type of cross-sections. The LHC has a more ambitious goal. They want to see things like the Higgs boson or supersymmetry, um, which have even strong, smaller cross-sections. So, for example, the Higgs boson cross-section. Does anyone know what the cross-section is roughly for producing a Higgs boson? Probably femtobarn. Yeah, it's a bigger. It's a bit bigger than a femtobarn. Um, I, I usually say it's it's you know order picobarn. Say, yeah, let me say ten picobarns, um, which is the minus. So this is um, ten to the minus eleven barns. Um, let's let's just say picobarn. Make it simpler. Right. So this is. Uh, oh. um, so this is this is now a factor of a million. So this is uh, sigma proton divided by ten to the minus nine. So that means roughly we have to collide a billion protons to produce a Higgs boson. Okay, um, but now uh, if we're actually interested in seeing the Higgs, we need to produce more than one Higgs boson, right? So if you take into account the fact that we want to see the Higgs boson. Say you need to have the, the branching ratio of the Higgs to something you're interested in, say gamma gamma, two photons. This is 10 to the minus three. Um, and there's some efficiency factors. That is, you don't see every event that's a Higgs, and there's a huge background, so maybe that's another factor of 10 to the minus two. Um, and then say you want to see number of events, so I want, say, 100 events, so there's another factor of 10 to the minus two. Um, so we get 10 to the minus seven. Um, so uh, say we want to see 100 events in a year, right? That means we want to collide, have collided 10 to the 7 times 10 to the 9 protons in that year, right? 10 to 7 is roughly the number of seconds in a year. So that means roughly we want to collide a billion protons a second, right? So this is a kind of a typical goal of the LHC. We want um, 1 billion uh, protons per second which is one gigahertz. So the goal is we want to have enough luminosity. We want to put the protons, bunch them up, make, make tight enough bunches, collide them together fast enough so that we're colliding roughly um, a billion protons a second so that we can produce enough Higgses that we'll see them. Um, and the goals for um, beyond the standard model physics, so this is you know 10 picobarn cross-section for the Higgs. Um, some supersymmetry might be femtobarn range. Um, which means we'll need to run for a lot longer and get, get even more collisions. But this was kind of a reasonable um, starting point for thinking about um, the LHC. Um, 
So how do we get a gigahertz uh, uh, throughput? What, how do we get a, a gigahertz collisions? Um, well, uh, do you guys have a rough sense of how the LHC works? Yeah. How, how many of you have, have been to CERN? Okay. Maybe two thirds of you. How many of you have seen Atlas or CFS? Okay. So less than half of you. Um, how many of you were impressed when you saw Atlas or CFS? Only three of you, huh? <laughs> That's kind of sad. Well, I was impressed when I saw Atlas in particular. I mean, this is an enormous, you know, five-story building that's all just electronics. It's pretty impressive, and I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll show pictures of it um, uh, in a minute. But um, the, the basic idea of the LHC, so uh, we have a ring. How big is the ring? 27 kilometers. Okay, you know that number. What else do you know about the LHC? What? You know, it's energy. Oh, what is the energy? What is it running at now? 13 TV. 13 TV. Okay, what else do you know about it? What? Four detectors. But, but okay, let's concentrate on the accelerator. So, how many protons are running around the LHC? Anyone know that? Well, how are they running out? Is it, is it, um, a stream of protons going this way and a stream going that way? They're bunches, right? So it's not just a continuum. There's little bunches that go all the way around. How many bunches are there? I don't know. Okay, uh, how far apart are the bunches? This you might know. This is a number that's, that just changed. 25 nanoseconds. So these are separated by 25 nanoseconds. So a nanosecond is roughly a foot. So I don't know if you guys know what feet are. But, um, a, th a third of a meter, right? So this is roughly 10 meters. Um, uh, okay, so 25 nanoseconds. So nanosecond, 25 nanoseconds, a nanosecond is 25 times 10 to the minus 9 seconds. Um, so here we have our 10 to the 9 seconds, so this is, uh, I think it's 40 megahertz, right? So this means uh, we're colliding 40 million bunches per second. Um, uh, and you can work out they're moving roughly at the speed of light. Um, and in a 27 kilometer ring, uh, this means there's around 2,000 bunches. Okay, how many protons are in a bunch? Millions? Billions? Trillions? Uh, Avogadro's number? <laughs> Just kind of clunks, big chunks of matter. Um, yeah, so um, there are this isn't very well organized. Um, let me go. Uh, put this up here. Um, so there's around 10 to the 11 uh, protons per bunch. Um, so you have these bunches with 10 to the 11 protons in each bunch. Um, and uh, when they're going around the ring, they're about, about a millimeter. Um, or even a centimeter, they fluctuate a little. And but when they get to the bunch crossing, they try to compress them as small as possible because the smaller you make the beam size, the more collisions you'll get. Um, and so they manage to compress to uh, um, around something like uh, 10 to 100 microns. Right, so this is 10 to the, say, 10 to the minus 5 uh, uh, meters. Um, okay, so if we have 10 to the 11 protons at 10 to the minus 5 meters, then we can figure out uh, how many collisions we'll get from these bunches. So we have this bunch that's, uh, you know, 10 microns colliding against this one that's 10 microns. Um, and so we have 10 to the 11 in here and 10 to the 11 here, so the number of collisions 
is 10 to the 11 squared, because we have two, um, two bunches with 10 to the 11 protons, um, times the cross-section for the proton divided by this cross-sectional area, which is 10 to the minus 10 meters squared with maybe a 3. Right, and we said this was 10 to the minus um, 30 square meters. So we get 10 to the 22, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 2. So we get around 100. Right? So that means we have 100, uh, 100 proton scatterings, let me say inelastic uh, PP collisions. per bunch crossing. Right? So we have 100 of these, and the bunches are going at 40 megahertz. Right? So we're getting uh, roughly, so you put these together, times this equals uh, 4 gigahertz. So that's roughly the number of inelastic proton-proton scatterings that we get per second, it's roughly 4 billion per second um, at the LHC, right? And you can just sort of estimate these things knowing, I mean, all we really need to know about the LHC was the 25 nanoseconds, and even if you didn't know it, or oh, maybe 10 to the 11 protons, you could work backwards um, and figure out what it would have to be so that you could achieve um, something like this, which is really the minimal thing you need to, for LHC to be useful um, for Higgs physics. Um, there's another number that uh, we often use to describe uh, uh, the, the luminosity for the LHC. Uh, so, ever heard of uh, numbers for instantaneous luminosity? How, how much the LHC is running, how fast, how many collisions it's getting? Um, so, we say the instantaneous luminosity which, I don't know, they use different letters for it, L. Um, the, the design goal of the LHC was roughly 10 to the 34 um, per centimeter squared per second. So this number, you'll hear this number a lot when you start paying attention to the LHC. Um, you know, now they're running at 10 to the 33 or so, 10 to the, you know, 5 times 10 to the 32. I mean, the goal is when they ramp up, they'll get to 10 to the 34. Um, so uh, uh, these are units, so this luminosity number it, it really encodes all this business of the bunches and the bunch spacing and the squeezing so that you just get this single number, right? So now we can just take this luminosity and multiply by the cross-section, um, which is, so 10 to the 34, let's convert to, uh, so 10 to the minus 4 meters squared um, per second times the proton cross-section, which was uh, 10 to the minus 30 meters squared. So we get um, 10 to the 8 uh, per second, um, which is uh, 100 megahertz. So it's not, you know, it, it's same order of magnitude as the number we computed here, right? So there's just two different ways of computing the same thing. This number that they'll, they'll just publish, if you just look at what the current running is, well, the running, what the current um, luminosity is um, that Atlas or, or CMS are taking in, they'll give you a number like this, um, which you can then just multiply by the cross-section you want to figure out how many collisions you get. Um, and it encodes the information about these number of bunches, number of protons, squeezing things down, all of the accelerator physics that um, we often don't care about, but it's good to have heard about once and, and just have in the back of your mind how this machine actually works. Um, are there questions about this? Okay, um, so uh, okay, so what do you do? So you have a hundred, you have a billion inelastic collisions. By the way, when I say inelastic, right, that means a collision where the proton breaks apart, right? I mean, you can the the, the problem with defining this total cross section for the proton, this thing that I erased, which was, um, you know, we say it's sixty millibarns or thirty millibarns or something like that, um, is that you? It's not even precise in quantum field theory because you can't. If you collide two protons, when do you consider it a collision? If they, you know, it's not really a, it's quantum mechanics, so you don't really have localized things. So when you collide something, 
if it just scatters a very little bit, do you consider that a scattering or not? Right? And there's this kind of the, the problem is that when they're when they scatter and go exactly out the way they came in, um, so it's called that diffractive scattering. Um, do you count it or do you not count it as scattering? And there's actually a singularity there, so it would be infinite if you included it. Um, so you have to have some kind of cutoff and some, some rough idea of what you mean. Um, and the cleanest thing to do is just talk about inelastic scattering, where the final state is not protons. And that becomes well-defined. And then you can just ask, what is the uh, rate for inelastic scattering? And that's what that 30 um, or 60 millibartons refers to. Um, uh, right. Um, okay. So, uh, so we get around a billion collisions a second, maybe one of which uh, is interesting. Um, we get uh, uh, for each bunch crossing, there's there's a hundred of these collisions. This number a hundred is referred to. Sometimes we call this mu. The symbol mu is used. It's the average number of interactions uh, per bunch crossing. So when the bunches cross, when well, let me say, so here's the beam, the one beam coming in, and here's a bunch of protons, and here's another beam of protons, and these are kind of elongated because they're going very fast. So they collide on top of each other, and you'll get. Um, well, I should draw them on top of each other. Here, now they're on top of each other. So they collide, and um, you'll have a hundred different interaction points within the bunch crossing. Um, and this is all essentially simultaneous from the point of view of the detector. So you have uh, simultaneous interactions at a hundred places in the collision, most of which aren't interesting, most of which are what we call minimum bias collisions, where the proton might break apart, but mostly it's just soft radiation. Um, um, nevertheless, you get a lot of particles coming out, um, from all these different interactions. Um, and uh, the majority of these collisions, of the billion collisions we have a second, um, all hundred of these uh, inelastic collisions will be minimum bias and we don't care about them. Um, right, remember, yeah, I'm, we only get a hundred per bunch crossing and we're looking for one in a million collisions. So that means that, you know, 10 to the 7 or whatever of the collisions won't produce anything interesting, won't produce a Higgs. You know, maybe 10 to the 3 won't produce anything, and 10 to the 1 and 10 to the 5 might produce a W boson and so on. So most of these collisions are what we call minimum bias collisions where nothing interesting happens. Nevertheless, even when there is something, so when you have a kind of a hard collision where you produce something interesting, maybe a Higgs and a jet or something, um, you still have all these other interactions that you have to deal with. Um, and the more you increase, so this luminosity number, 10 to the 34, is directly proportional to this number of, this, this number mu, the number of collisions per bunch crossing. So one problem that happens at the LHC is when we increase luminosity, you get more of this uh, pileup. This is called pileup. Um, and at the first run of the LHC, at 7 TeV, at the 7 TeV run, there wasn't that much pileup. There was maybe five pileup interactions per bunch crossing. Um, uh, at the late end of the run, it went up to maybe 20. Um, when they decreased the uh, um, um, bunch spacing to 25 nanoseconds, so at the 7 TV run, it was 50 nanoseconds. It was twice as long. Um, and then the pileup went up. But then when you increase it to 20, 25 nanoseconds, you have more bunches. So to get the same number of collisions, you can actually have fewer protons in the bunch or tune them less. So you get half as many pileup interactions, which you need to go to higher luminosity. Um, and so the goal is that, that the expectation is that the 13 TeV run will have 100 to 200 pileup interactions. We haven't gotten there yet, um, but this is kind of the, the estimate of what we'll have to deal with when we get to these, um, this type of luminosity, hopefully sometime next year, um, or this year even. Um, but, but it depends. And then there's talks about increasing luminosity LHC for an upgrade, the VLHC, um, which might go to even 10 to 35, which could have 1,000 pileup interactions for bunch crossing. Um, and one of the real challenges there, there's an accelerator challenge, whether you can compress the beam strong enough, put enough protons in a bunch to get to 30, 10 to the 35. But there's also a detector issue, which is when you have a thousand pileup interactions, you just get so many tracks, you have to be able to resolve them to see what's going on. You have so much energy that you get huge fluctuations and you have to um, try to make sense out of it. Um, so dealing with pileup is actually a very active area of research, both from the experimental side and on the theory side, coming up with theory-based methods for removing pileup, um, which um, I may come back to um, in the last lecture about jets. Um, but anyhow, let's let's go back to just these, this this uh, 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 dimensional analysis business. Um, so there's another problem. So we have. Um, 
a billion collisions per second, uh, and the data has to somehow be stored somewhere. So you have this data coming out, you have a billion events per second. Keep in mind also that, you know, these are colliding at 25 nanoseconds, so they go 10 meters, but, you know, Atlas is 100 meters. So you have these collisions every 10 meters, and then you have, you know, 10 collisions propagating through the detector all at once. So there's a huge electronics problem not mixing everything up, and you have to record things, and then you have to reset your electronics so that you can record the next event and keep track of what it was, what it was. You also have to keep track of the length of the wires coming out of the different part of the detector components because the speed that the data travels might mix up your detector packets. I mean, it's, it's hard to, um, to conceive about how complicated a uh, scientific accomplishment building these machines are and keeping track of everything. Um, and that's why if you haven't visited Atlas, you really, your CMS, you should go to LHC, go see what's going on, see how they work because it's amazing and it really gives you an appreciation of what has to be done, um, for this kind of physics. Um, but in any case, so you have these collisions, all this data is coming out. Um, let me know how, how big an event is when they write all this data to disk, how much space it takes up on a disk. Yeah, what event? Yeah. 100 megabytes. Um, yeah, it, so, well, I, I think that the number usually is around one megabyte. Um, Remember, a megabyte is huge. A megabyte is a million bytes. So there's a lot of information there. If you just run Pythia, you know, your event is not a megabyte at all, right? A megabyte's a lot. You know, it's maybe 2K, something like that, right? Um, so, and the reason it's so big is because it has all the, the low-level detector information. It doesn't just distill it down to here's a muon and here's a jet. It has, there was this energy deposit in this part of the calorimeter and so on, and all of that has to be stored. Um, and the problem is that, so an event, uh, let's go over here. So one event is one megabyte. Um, and so the limiting factor is really how much data you can possibly write, how fast your cables can carry the data, and how fast you can write it to, to, to tape. Um, and what they can do is roughly, um, say, write speed is around 100 gigabytes per second, which is a lot, right? I mean, you have your you know, a hundred gigabyte hard drive, and in one second you write the whole thing, right? That, that, that's fast, um, but you know, this is state-of-the-art electronics that can do this. Um, uh, nevertheless, this, this is, so we have um, uh, one megabyte, a hundred gigabytes is a uh, hundred thousand, right? Um, 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 I'm sorry, this is, 200 megabytes per second, which is also quite a lot, but not nearly as big as 100 gigabytes. That's that's a, a design goal for future electronics. People have been talking about for the um, China Collider, which is something we might talk about um, in a minute. But anyway, so this says that, that roughly, this means that we can write 100 hertz, 100 events um, per second. So uh, a big challenge of the LHC is going from a billion collisions a second to 100. Um, so which, which hundred, um, and to decide that you have to deal with triggers. Um, so triggering at the LHC is important. Um, if ever you're trying to think about a way to find your favorite model or, um, different kinds of things that you can measure, you can only possibly see something if they write it to disk, if they actually record it. Um, and they can't record everything. Um, so these triggers tell you what the thresholds are for the different particles that lets them, that's the right to disk, so you could possibly start your analysis. Um, and uh, you don't have to know the details of it. And in fact, the triggers depend very much on the luminosity, because this 100 events doesn't depend on luminosity, but the uh, 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 1 gigahertz does, right? So at lower luminosity, it might not be 1 gigahertz, it might be 100 megahertz, right? So you have 10 times fewer events, that means that you can have 10 times weaker triggers um, to record the same number of events, and you can record higher energy stuff or lower energy stuff, and so on. Um, so I don't want to go into this too detail, but you should have a sense of, of how the triggers work um, to think about collider physics. So generally, there's um, two levels, what we call low-level trigger. Uh, 
and high level trigger. Um, the low level trigger is a hardware trigger. So there's a lot of it has to be just done with electronics. This is hard coded into the way the machine was built and little bits of it can be changed, um, but mostly it's just, it's kind of fixed. So these are the, the, the low level trigger has to do the first pass to, to reduce the factor of a million, um, right, we're, 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 well, what do we need? So we did it right 100 hertz and we had a gigahertz, so we need a factor of 10 to the 7. So out of the 10 to the 7, the low level trigger does 10 to the 4 of it or so, and the high level trigger does the rest. Um, and, um, uh, there's also, we, we also talk about level, this is sometimes called level zero, um, and this is level one, but sometimes this is called level one and this is level two. And, and sometimes there's level two and one and two. Uh, they're not really consistent with this leveling in CMS and Atlas do something different. Um, it doesn't really matter. Level zero is always low level. Um, uh, and sometimes people just talk about high level trigger. Um, and the high level triggers are done um, sometimes a combination of um, hardware and software, um, but that there's very advanced uh, triggers that can be done only in software. For example, um, JET, if you want to use a JET algorithm, that's really a high level processing of data, um, or missing energy. Missing energy is something that has to be done at high level because it involves the whole detector. Um, and the whole detector is not something that the hardware stuff really has to be local. So the low level stuff is things like if there was a muon that went out there, I can just kind of collect the tracks going in the same direction, um, and I can have some electronics that that is concerned with that, or something involving tracks. If I want to do um, B tagging, I can do a low level trigger for B tagging looking for a displaced vertex. Uh, so I'll talk about some of these things more when we talk about the different particles and how they show up. Um, but let me just give you a roughly a sense of what the triggers are. Um, so you, you've seen this and kind of have it in your mind somewhere. Uh, uh, so let's say, um, so, uh, so there's a trigger is one electron um, isolated with transverse momentum greater than 25 GeV. So if there's ever a single electron that they see that's greater than 25 GeV, they write that whole event to tape, right? And if you just look at uh, how often this happens, it's roughly 40 hertz. So you get 40 times a second, you get a 25 GeV electron. Right? So this is out of the billion collisions, 40 of them uh, have, have an electron of this um, sort. Or you can get two electrons. And if there's two electrons, um, <coughs> that's rarer, and therefore you can lower the PT threshold. And this is PT greater than um, 15 GeV. Actually, the 40, 40 hertz corresponds to the sum of these two triggers. Um, right. But if you're interested in a, a 5 GeV electron, it's just not recorded. If you want some, if you have some model that has produces only very soft electrons, you're not going to see them. They're not going to be recorded, and we'll lose that. Um, um, we can have one photon greater than 60 GeV, um, or two photons greater than 20 GeV. Uh, this is also 40 hertz. Um, we can have a muon, one muon greater than 20, or two muons greater than 10. Uh, this is another 40 hertz. Uh, we can have one jet, 400 GeV, uh, three jets, greater than 165 GeV, four jets, greater than 110 GeV, uh, what else do we have, one tau, one. greater than 35, uh, one tau on plus missing energy, um, this is greater than 35, and the missing energy has to be greater than 45. And I'll review these, what a tau one is and what missing energy is and so on. But I just want to summarize the trivials. This is 20 hertz, 
Um, this was the one jet is 25 hertz. Put these parentheses so we can see them. This is 20 hertz. This is 5 hertz. Um, there's also a, a, a B tag trigger, which is 10 hertz. And then there's, um, well, so these are, these are the basic triggers. These are the kinds of things that they can trigger on. So electrons that are reasonably hard, the more particles you have, the lower you can let set the trigger thresholds. Um, uh, photons, there's a lot of photons, so they have to be at least 60 GeV if you want one of them, or 20 GeV if you want two. Um, but notice the jet, the jet has to be 400 GeV if you want a single jet um, event um, that is inclusive over one jet, right? Um, really, this is the same. This is the, 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 the reason this is so large is because the most of the proton collisions are, remember, are strong interactions. So you get these kind of die jet events where you produce two jets going back to back. That's the dominant type of hard interaction you get. Um, it's so hard that if you had uh, this jet trigger less than 400 GV, if you tried to keep all 300 GV jets, you would have you know, 1,000 of those a second or 10,000 of those a second and overwhelm everything else. So you have to push this up to 400 GV so that you have room to record other things. But that means if you have some particle that decays to two jets that are 300 GeV, you won't see it. Um, so the LHG has kind of holes in its sensitivity to lower energy stuff. Conveniently, the, uh, at lower luminosity, they weaken the trigger. So the early runs of the LHC were actually very useful for um, ruling out models that would decay to stuff that the high trigger triggers would just throw out. Um, nevertheless, there were still holes, and it's something to just keep in mind. Um, uh, at, at the back of your head. Uh, so if you sum this up, I, 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 so there's 40, 40, 10, 40. It's roughly 200 hertz, which is roughly what they can do um, now. Um, and as I said, as the, as the LHC increases in luminosity, um, we'll have to decrease these uh, uh, trigger thresholds. Um, yeah. Well, that is the two jets. One, yeah. Yeah, two jets. You can't have one without recoiling against something, so you always get two. Um, I mean, you could have one jet missing energy, for example, mono jets, and that would be a missing ET trigger, um, which they also have a global missing ET trigger, but uh, actually, I don't know if they have a global e missing ET trigger. I don't have it on my list. I have another. Um, actually, let me let me stop and go to this slide. So I have a picture of the. Let's do this. Let's see if that works. Oh, I pushed the wrong button. Okay, here's a picture of the. You've probably seen this before, and I've got an echo. Move that away. Um, it's the LHC ring. Just to give you a sense of size, there's Geneva, Lake Geneva in the background. Um, 27 kilometers is pretty big. Uh, I want to show you this uh, video from CERN of just the operation of the LHC, which you've probably seen. This is on on YouTube. Um, but it just gives you gives you a sense of how things run, and maybe I'm gonna give you a picture of things. It's just a few minutes, so maybe we can take a break and watch the video. Um, and there's the four main detectors. So you start with producing. Well, I, I can hear myself echo. Am I not being recorded? I'll put it closer. Okay. Um, right. So the protons just hydrogen gas protons. You ionize the uh, hydrogen. Um, uh, th this video shows a lot of the accelerator components, which I like about it because they're often not discussed. So there's different components. There's the uh, uh, proton signatron and then the super proton signatron. And, okay. Uh, um, these previous accelerators at CERN, uh, the um, SPS was the, the, the accelerator before they built the LHC um, a tunnel, so that where the W boson was discovered was with the super proton synchrotron, and now it's an injector into the Large Hadron Collider. Um, so there's the, the beam pipe. Uh, there's two beams. There's different ways of designing it. Uh, um, the way it works at the LHC is there's two by beams that are next to each other um, within the pipe. You can kind of see them. I don't know why it's so choppy. Uh, okay, there's an example collision. So here they're showing, what they're trying to show is these uh, bunches. So those red things are the uh, bunches. They're extended because they're moving so fast. Uh, 
um, this is about the, I don't know what this is. <laughs> okay, there are the beams again going back and forth. So obviously they go in opposite directions. Um, and then, you know, to make magnetic fields so that you collide these parallel beams into a, a focus amount of point is not so easy. Uh, um, these are what they call the quadrupole focusing beams. And there come, so there are the beams coming together. This is a gizmo that uh, m measures the beam profile. So this measures the shape of the beam, tell you how much they're squeezing it. Um, so it just says something, slides it through and scatters. That's a picture of what, this is going very fast. Um, there, you saw there was a picture of the beam spot. Uh, let me, that, that was, I think that was, let's go back a second. Uh, oh, there it was again. Anyway, that was a picture of what the beam looks like. Um, so they have, they have things to test that everything's actually working. Um, it's actually very hard to figure out this number, 10 to the 11 protons per bunch. Um, you have a rough idea, but you have to measure it. So the luminosity of the LHC, how much, what the actual luminosity is, is um, they have special design detectors to measure it because they don't always know. Um, uh, this is about the computing facility, which is enormous. And you see it's a lot of it's done in parallel. Um, and they need to do that to get this 200 megabits a second, megabytes a second. And then they discuss the, um, you guys know about the tier, the, the, how the data is distributed? So there's two copies of every event of the LHC. One is stored at CERN and one is distributed to, uh, uh, which is the tier zero center. And then there's tier one centers all around the world that have additional copies of this data that they use to analyze. Um, there aren't that many. Um, uh, for example, there's, the, there's a tier one center for CMS at Fermilab in the US, um, and there's a tier one center for Atlas at Brookhaven. Those are the only two tier one centers um, in the US, and there's a lot of tier two centers distributed around. Uh, and those, those do more high-level processing, distilling things down to events that other experimentalists can use, and then they distribute them around to local clusters. Um, so it's a really a huge worldwide computing effort uh, to make sense out of the LHC data. Um, here's a low luminosity trigger table. Well, I, this is similar to what I showed before. Um, let me skip it. Um, okay. Uh, um, uh, okay, so I want to start talking about the detectors a little bit next. Uh, are there questions about this business of colliding protons? How many we expect? Uh, what kind of collisions? What the goals are? Accelerator physics, basically. So it's good to see. And just to summarize, you'll you'll hear this number. Keep an eye on the number ten to the thirty-four. Um, you'll see how that grows with time. It's something that roughly tells you luminosity and, um, you know, lessons are pile up increases with luminosity. It's something we have to worry about and trigger thresholds have to increase too. Um, so, but you of course get more collisions. So there's trade-offs, uh, with higher luminosity. Um, okay. Uh, let me, uh, I, I want to leave these slides on a little bit longer to just talk a little bit about Atlas and CMS. There's, uh, so just for scale, there's people over here. Um, in case you don't appreciate it, I mean, that's just enormous. It's this, you know, five-story building. Um, Atlas and CMS are roughly the same ideas. I mean, all modern detectors work um, essentially the same way. There's, uh, the, so the protons collide over here. Um, uh, at short distance, you have the tracking system. So very close to the collisions, you really need very high resolution to see charged tracks. You need a strong magnetic field, and then you need to have um, this is the most expensive part of the detector is this, so Atlas has a three-part tracker. It has a, a, a the, what are called the uh, silicon uh, semiconductor tracker, the pixel tracker, and the transition radiation tracker. Um, they work at different levels of resolution. So the pixel is the highest resolution. It's the shortest distance. And as it gets farther apart, you can get away with lower resolution, both spatial and um, uh, energy resolution um, as you get farther away out of the center. Um, the next element of the detector is the um, electromagnetic calorimeter, which is uh, an atlas is a liquid argon calorimeter. Um, and uh, outside of it is the tile calorimeter, which is for hadronic energy. Uh, so the idea is that the electromagnetic calorimeter measures the energy of essentially electrons and photons. Um, and the things that get through 
the um, the ECAL and the HCAL are things like pions and protons. Um, and then on the outside are the muon detector, which is the thing, uh, um, which is the rest of it. Um, and uh, Atlas is very big. It has a, a, a two Tesla magnetic field to bend the muons so you can tell their energy because the muons basically go through the whole detector. It's the only way to measure their energy is if you bend them and see the curvature of the track. Um, uh, CMS is qualitatively similar. It's denser. It, it, it has, so if you want to measure a muon in the smaller distance, you need a stronger field. So it has roughly four Tesla magnetic fields compared to two Tesla um, uh, for Atlas. Um, and it has the same general idea. There's a, a pixels and silicon tracker on the inside. Um, there's a electromagnetic calorimeter. Um, so for, uh, um, for CMS, it's this, this uh, tungstate state crystals, uh, which is a solid state scintillator as opposed to the liquid argon. Um, in Atlas, um, that's really essentially the difference. Um, and then the hadronic calorimeter is essentially the same. Um, and the muon calorimeter is just denser because it has a higher field. Um, but the, the, the numbers are roughly similar. Um, uh, yeah, they both have 75 million of these pixels, so these things that measure the, the track. So when a charged particle comes into the, uh, the vertex detector, it, there's 75 million places where it can, it can um, be recorded where, where the particles went. Um, I can just, uh, I mean, from a, from a theorist's point of view, you don't have to know that much about the difference between CMS and Atlas. Uh, but let me just uh, write down a few things occasionally useful, so. Let's see if there's anything else I needed. Oh, right, let me just show this last, let me just show this one last slide, then I can turn it off and I can, you can record me on the board. So this is just an example of, this, this is an atlas plot. This is, you've probably seen this in every experimental talk you've ever been to. Um, but uh, it roughly shows what, what the different parts of the detector measure. Um, so essentially, the things that you can see in a detector are the stable particles, stable on, you know, longer than, I don't know, the picosecond. Um, and those are photons, electrons, muons, hadrons, like pions, protons, kaons, k-long, neutrons. Um, and, uh, and the other thing that gets out of the detector are neutrinos. Um, that's essentially it. And we'll talk about these more a little bit later. So uh, what this shows is photons. They go right through the tracker, don't leave any tracks because they're neutral. Um, but then they show up in the electromagnetic calorimeter interacting with the liquid argon or the, the tungstate state crystals. Um, and then they, they lose all their energy there and don't make it to the hadron calorimeter. Um, electrons show a track, so you can tell electrons from photons by looking at the tracking chamber. Um, and they also shower in the eCal. Um, muons go through the whole thing. Uh, um, you'll see a track because it's charged. Uh, the track is often straight because you don't have enough time to resolve it for at least hard muons. Soft muons, you can see bending in the chamber. They'll make minor deposits in the ECAL and HCAL because they're heavy um, and very energetic. They don't radiate much. Um, and then the idea is they get to the muon chamber and you bend them and you see the curvature of the track. Um, uh, pions and protons also uh, are heavy, so they don't radiate much in the ECAL. The charged ones. Uh, show up in the tracker, and then they, the hadron calorimeter is assigned. I mean, it's this really heavy, uh, you know, lead thing that's assigned to, to absorb all the energy of these, so you can measure all the energy deposits in the HCAL. Um, a neutron is an example of a particle that's neutral but hadronic, so it goes right through the tracker and the ECAL and deposits all its energy in the HCAL. Um, so because all of these are different, in principle, you can distinguish these classes of particles, and it's useful for particle identification. Um, any questions about these slides before I turn them off? Yeah, well, ta taus are complicated. They, they decay short. They, they have a short lifetime, so they decay into other things. So um, most particles, I mean, you can say the same thing about tops, right? So taus are really, it's not a, 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 it's not a stable particle from the point of view of the detector. Um, yeah. Um, other questions about these before I? Turn this off? Okay, well, we can come back to it if we want. Um, I want to look at my 
so. Right. Um, so, um, so really, the, the the differences between CMS are they have this. Um, uh, yeah. So, so the eCal is somewhat different, and the the CMS has better. Um, it has better energy resolution. And that was the design of CMS. CMS thought that they were all going to be about the age scale, so they would see the Higgs to gamma gamma first because they had this great um, electromagnetic calorimeter, and they'd be able to measure it better and get a better Higgs mass measurement from the photons. It turned out in practice it actually wasn't that much better, um, and they're roughly the same. Um, uh, and Atlas is um, uh, um, what we call high granularity. So high granularity can lead to better um, spatial resolution. Um, this is the eCal. Um, it's also more radiation resistant. So this was a, a design choice that Atlas made. They wanted to. They chose liquid argon because it was more stable when. You know, running these things a billion collisions a second, um, eventually you put so much radiation that you just destroy your components. Um, and that's why we have to have all these shutdowns all the time and they have to fix things. Um, and Atlas didn't want to have to fix as much of their thing as CMS did. So CMS was willing to live with a less radiation resistant eCal so they could have better energy resolution. Um, that was a compromise that was made. But again, in practice, um, they're about the same energy resolution. Um, CMS has something called particle flow, uh, which is really a, a, a way of processing the data. So what CMS claims to do is take all of the take the event and and determine uh, what particles came out of the hard interaction. So it can really assign whether they were uh, pions or protons or neutrons or muons or electrons or photons. So that each particle has this property. Right? I mean, that's a very powerful thing. So it's, it ends up just looking like your Pythia event record, um, which is really a dream from a theory point of view. And what's impressive is that they were actually able to do this. This was a technique that was developed first by CDF um, at the Tevatron, um, and the, a lot of the same physicists started applying it um, at CMS, and it seems to work. So this is a really nice success. Um, that the, the early run of the LHC, they didn't have this working. But when they did the ATED run, they had it down. And now there's a lot of good particle flow data. Um, um, some of which CMS has actually made pub public. Um, Atlas doesn't do particle flow, but they have something else called topo clusters. Um, topo clusters are, are a way of combining the, the calorimetry information. So from the electromagnetic and the hadronic calorimeter, it has, it, it, the, the reason this is challenging is because if you have you know, a pion and a proton coming in at the same time, you know, and say a neutron too, um, you have to be able to, to separate all of them. Um, so you need very good spatial resolution to be able to tell apart there were two charged hadrons next to each other rather than just one. Um, um, so uh, CMS can do this to some extent um, using its um, uh, lead tungstate state calorimeter. Atlas can't do it as well with liquid argon, but they, what they have are these topo clusters, which are basically maps like this that are energy deposits, and they tell you where the energy went, how much went into which place within um, the, the topological object, the part of the, the calorimetry. So they can, it's not quite a particle, but you can see that there, maybe there's two particles or maybe there's one. Um, so this is something that can be used, and it's used at a higher level in jet physics, for example. They use the topo cluster information because it has very good spatial resolution. Um, um, but it doesn't tell you the particles. But again, you don't really care whether it was a proton or a pion or two pions or whatever. You might care that there's two particles and not one, but you might not really care which they are. Um, so this is just a tool that, that Atlas has. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to mention is jet size. Uh, and CMS likes to use um, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, and Atlas uses 0 0.4 or 0 0.6. 
This is uh, an unending source of frustration to people who want to um, study jets um, because you can't directly compare the distributions from the two experiments. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll be talking more about jets as we go on. Um, but, uh, but roughly speaking, R equals 0.5. So this 0.5 is 0.5 in, in uh, rapidity and azimuthal angle space. Um, and we'll, we'll actually review these in a second. Um, but uh, so you just think of it as a cone of some size r on, on the surface of a sphere or a cylinder. Um, and uh, something you should, you should also know about jets is that generally what they do is they calibrate the energy of the jet. So this is somewhat historical that they think of a jet as an object itself. So we like to imagine a jet coming from the, the radiation of a quark or a gluon produced at short distances. So the typical story, and we'll, we'll cover this in some detail, is that you have some hard collision producing quarks, and then you get this radiation of, of gluons off of them, and maybe you have a splitting of a gluon into two quarks and so on. Um, and, um, and, and somehow you measure all of this energy, and you construct some four vector for the jet, p mu jet which is the sum of all the particles in jet of p mu j. So you just take all the momenta of all the particles and you sum them together and you call that the jet momentum, right? Um, and, and the idea is that this jet momentum should have something to do with this original quark momentum, right? And to a very good approximation, it does, um, to the extent that this even is well-defined. So this is certainly well-defined. This isn't well-defined, but, but just, Pushing ahead, that's, that's roughly what you're going to say. For example, if I had um, you know, a Z boson uh, decay to two quarks, what I would see in the detector is two jets. And then I would construct the four momentum for this jet and the four momentum for that jet. And if I added them up and squared it, I should reproduce the Z mass, something like that. Right? Um, so there's a sense in which you, you don't really care about the individual particles in the jet. What you care about is the total momentum. Um, and this is certainly the, the only way they thought about jets at the Tevatron um, and at the start of the LHC. But in the last five years or so, people have realized that there's a lot of information in this what's called jet substructure. So the jet is not just a four vector. It's actually all the particles that make up the jet. Um, and there's a lot of interesting active research um, involved in this, which I'll, 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 I'll talk about a little. Um, but the point I want to make here is when you think of the jet as a four vector, you have to know uh, what, what, how you calibrate the energy of the jet. And you'd like to say the energy of the jet is the sum of the energies of the particles, right? I say, of course, that's true. Um, however, because of the way the calorimeters work, when you have a particle here and a particle there, the detector doesn't read them as the sum of the energy here and here. There's nonlinearities in the way the detector is read out. Um, and so the truth is you can't just add up all the particles because, first of all, you didn't even know what the particles were to begin with. Um, so what they do instead is they do an overall correction to the energy of the jet. So, so these things don't really exist. What the, the detector will do, what the experiment will do is process the, all the particles in the jet to a single object, and then they'll calibrate that. So they have a set of, of really carefully done low-level calibration tools based on a particular jet size. So the bigger the jet is, the more these nonlinearities will be important. Um, so that's why they, they choose these jet sizes, and then they do the jet energy scale calibration based on those jet sizes. Um, it's unfortunate from a theory point of view because you'd like to be able to compare them or just change the jet size to be whatever you like, but they only use these sizes because of the way the calibration has been done. However, in the last few years, they've actually been changing that. Because with particle flow, they can do the calibration with the level of particle. That wouldn't make any sense if the energy of the jet weren't the sum of the energies of the particles. Um, so what they're able to do is, is remove the nonlinearities at the level of the particle, right? And that's something that's exactly what particle flow is designed to do, separate out the individual particles as stable form momenta. And topo clusters doesn't really do that. Um, but topo clusters can call the one topo cluster an object that's being clustered. And you don't know what it was. You don't know if it was a pion or a proton. But you can calibrate that at the level of the topo cluster, which is a kind of pseudo particle. Um, um, Atlas is working on something very similar to particle flow. And you suspect that in the next couple of years, it'll be the standard tool. Um, and if that's true, then we won't have to worry about these standardized jet size. Nobody will bother calibrating jet energy scales anymore. They'll calibrate particle flow candidates. 
um, and use those to combine jets, and that'll simplify everything. Um, but of course, it's complicated. Um, so that's what I wanted to say about those R's. Um, okay. Uh, questions about Atlas CMS? We'll come back to them a little bit more when we talk about particles, but um, this is the, that's basically the experimental part of my talk, the first lecture. We don't have any experimentalists here, so I have to take the role. Um, but, you know, as theorists, it, 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 it's important to know that you're doing physics, and there's an actual machine there measuring stuff, and it has physical components, and, you know, it's, it, you don't want to get too lost in the theory. You got to keep your feet on the ground, and coming back to this from time to time is very, very helpful. Um, okay. How are we doing on time? So we go till 5.30, is that the plan? Okay. Well, we'll get through what we get through, and then I'll continue tomorrow. So. Okay, so no questions? Is, I heard a question. Someone said something. Am I going too fast? You're too slow. How how's the speed? Okay, it's all right. Okay, well let me know. Please slow me down or speed me up. Um, I can go as fast as you want. Um, uh, but um, right. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the kinds of things that you can measure at Collider. What are the typical observables that we use for Collider physics? Um, uh, so, uh, first of all, we have a proton um, colliding with another proton. So this has momentum P1 mu, and this has momentum P2 mu. Um, and um, as I'm sure you know, the protons, when the protons collide, really it's partons within the proton that are colliding. So the quarks or gluons within the proton, and they'll have some, so there's some small component of this colliding with something like that. So you'll have Say the quark has momentum p. Which instrument would I use? Um, problem is my little p's and my big p's look the same on the board. So let me call it q. So q1 is some x1 times p mu1, and q2 x2 times p2 mu. So uh, these q's are the four momenta of the quarks being collided, and x's are the energy fraction of the original parton. So this is what also called Bjorken X. It has a lot of names. It's basically the amount of energy, the fraction of the proton's energy contained in the parton. And I have a whole lecture on the parton model. So we'll come back to this, but I'm sure you've heard this before. So I just want to use it as the starting point for um, uh, discussing the collider. So um, we do know the, so if you have a 13 TV collision, that means that each proton has six and a half TeV. Um, but these Xs are generally much, much less than that. Right, if you collide two things and you produce a hundred GeV jet, right, that hundred GeV is you know one sixtieth of the proton momentum. So this X is roughly one sixtieth, right? So these are small numbers, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, and so on. They're much less than the total momentum of the proton. Um, what I like to think of the proton as is as a big soup. So we think of this as a soup, and there's a bunch of little vegetables in the soup. You know, here's a carrot. Here's a potato. And, and most of the time, when you collide two bowls of soup at each other, it'll just make a splash, right? Mostly the liquid splashes into each other. But imagine if you collide the soup really, really fast, occasionally a carrot would collide with a potato, and you'd get something really, really exciting. Um, um, and that's really what's going on, that most of the time you just collide this liquid. It's this gluon mess within the proton. And you know you had these minimum bias collisions. It's just uh, it's just not very interesting. Um, but sometimes you get these hard collisions, and that's really what you're interested in. But it's relatively rare. And when it is, most of the momentum of the soup is not in the particular carrot. Most of it is contained in the rest of the the soup, which has some energy density, and that's where most of the energy is. Um, so it's rare that you'll get a large momentum in this. Um, not only is it rare, but it's almost never true that x1 equals x2. Um, Right? So if x1 equals x2, this would be 
a center of mass frame collision. So we're in the center of mass, the lab frame for this, so the protons are going back to back. Um, but it's rare that the quarks will be going back to back. Mostly, if x1 is larger than x2, this will be going much faster than this one. And so the whole thing will collide, and everything will go off in this direction. Right? Or if x2 is greater than x1, there'll be more of the overall net momentum in that direction, and you get your collision goes that way. Um, so um, this isn't terribly useful for physics. We don't want to worry about the overall boost of the event. Um, that is, when I say boost, I mean the, the uh, overall net momentum of the collision in the, along the beam axis. Uh, so we'd like to, most of the observables we're interested in are what we call boost invariant. Um, uh, so what does a boost do? So um, suppose we have some momentum Q mu. Let me write it as E QX QZ. Right, so, so typically we talk about, um, so Z is this direction. And maybe x is up, and y is that direction. So x and y are transverse to the beam directions, and z is in the beam direction, and e is energy. Um, so this is a four vector. If we want to change, if we want to give it, well, so if we were in the center of mass frame uh, for the two quarks, this would be fine. But then if we want to go from the center of mass frame to this frame where the collision actually happens, we can do that by a Lorentz boost. Um, in that direction. Um, and Lorentz boosts are nice because we know they're just representations of Lorentz group acting on four vectors. So we can just see how they transform. Um, and so this goes to uh, um, a boost. So if we want to boost in the z direction, we can just multiply by the boost matrix, which is like a rotation matrix, but with hyperbolic cosines instead of sines. So this would be 0, 0, 1, 1, cos. Zero, zero. There we go. Zero, 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 hmm. zero, zero. Oh, this is a cinch. All right. So this times Q mu. Um, so that means that E goes to E um, cosh beta plus Q Z. Fish beta and QZ goes to QZ Fish beta. So that's how they transform. Um, and we'd like to construct something that's invariant under this transformation. Uh, and, well, there's a lot of ways to do it, but let's just consider the quantity uh, right over here. E plus Q over E minus Q, Z. Um, this quantity goes to E, I'm going to call, I'll abbreviate Kosh with C and Cinch with S. So it goes to E um, S plus, then we get an S from this transformation, C, Q, Z, um, C plus S divided by E times C minus S. I should write this as C plus S. Get clear. Plus QZ minus S. Uh, minus. I think that's right. Is that clear? I'm just plugging these linear transformations in. Um, so now uh, let me multiply the top and the bottom by C plus S. So, uh, so C plus S times C minus S is C squared minus S squared, but cosh squared minus sin squared is 1. So we get 1 here, and we get this equals E plus QZ over E minus QZ times C plus S squared, right? So this particular quantity, when I boost it in the Z direction, just multiplies by a number, depending on the boost, right? Um, so then we define Y, this is called rapidity, 
is one half the logarithm of e plus qz. QZ. So now under a boost, this transforms to y um, plus one half log of c plus s squared, which I can just write as log c plus s. Right? So rapidity just shifts under a boost. Right? A boost is a very complicated thing to the momentum component in the z direction, but to this particular quantity, it just shifts it. And so in particular, this thing that it shifts by doesn't depend on the momentum. It just depends on, the, on how much you boosted it by. Right? Um, so if I take the rapidity for the first particle and I take the difference between the rapidity for, say, uh, Q1 and rapidity for Q2, or really, I'm interested in, in this outgoing particle, I don't know, K1 and K2. So we take the rapidity of K1 minus the rapidity of K2, so I'm calling Y1 minus Y2, under a boost, this just goes to y1 minus y2. So it's invariant under boost. Right? And I didn't have to specify anything about the mass of uh, k1 and k2 or anything like that. It's just for any particle, rapidity is a boost invariant quantity. Um, right? So what does that mean? Well, say I'm doing this, say I'm looking at the, you know, the production of, say, uh, two jets, right? And I want to know the angle that the jets are produced at, right? Well, if I just plot this angle, it's pretty random because I, I, don't, I don't learn anything. Or, say, um, you know, th this comes out at some angle theta, one, uh, theta 2, and this comes out at angle theta 1, and I can look at d sigma d delta theta as a function of delta theta. So the difference in angles between these, well, this is just some, it just, it depends very much on um, what x1 and x2 are and depends on the boost of the event. If I, if I boost back here, it'll be zero. If I boost there, something else. So I don't know why I get some distribution that's basically random. Um, but if I look at the difference between the rapidities of the particles, um, I'll get something that has some nice properties. So I'll find out that... Um, uh, you know, it might peak at some rapidity difference, that there's a characteristic scale for the difference in rapidities, um, because this delta eta, the difference between the rapidities of the objects I'm interested in, isn't sensitive to this overall boost, right? So by looking at boost invariant quantities, we can isolate interesting physics um, that would be lost if we just looked at lab frame quantities, like this, the scattering angle. Um, so... Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, I, uh, let me maybe be more precise. So suppose we, we look at um, uh, no, I'll, I'll do some examples later when we have more information. Um, um, where am I going? Okay. Uh, th there's another nice thing about rapidity is that uh, so here's rapidity. Right. So so again, if, if I have a particle here and another particle there. Um, the, the difference in rapidities between these is a useful quantity to characterize what that is, right? So, for example, if I had a, 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 a W boson decaying to uh, two jets, so this is W and this is jet one and this is jet two, which are really W decaying to quarks, decay to that, so, or uh, maybe a easier one is a Z. If I just do Z decaying to an electron and a, and a positron, right? If I look at the angle in the lab frame between the electron and the positron, it's not very interesting at all. Um, but if I look at the rapidity difference between the electron and the positron, I'll get some kind of distribution that has some peak of the characteristic angle between them that might depend on the momentum of the z, or the transverse momentum of the z, but doesn't depend on what the PDFs were to produce the z. So boosted quantities basically factor out an un unknown associated with uh, the energy going into the longitudinal momentum. 
Um, uh, okay, there, so there's a further simplification of rapidity in the, in the case where the momentum are massless. So for example, an electron, it does have a mass, but when we're talking about GeV scale, the electron mass is, wait, who knows the electron mass? 0.5 what? 0.5 MeV, yeah, 500 keV, right? So it's really light. So we basically neglect it. Um, we can neglect the mass of most particles, actually. We neglect the muon mass, we neglect the electron mass, we neglect basically all the quark masses. Um, the most things we can neglect the mass of. Most jets, even though jets are, can be, you know, 10, 20 GeV, to a leading approximation, we can ignore that compared to the, you know, 500 GeV energy of the jet. Um, so for a massless particle, uh, the so if you have a massless particle, q vector squared equals zero, that means the energy is the magnitude of the three momentum. Uh, so if we have the three momentum q, so let's draw the the longitudinal component of the momentum and the transverse component of the momentum. So the transverse momentum, I just mean the square root of my squared. And then this is the magnitude of this. This is just a triangle, which is also equal to the energy. Um, so uh, this angle has, uh, so this is just the angle that the thing is produced at in the lab frame. So the tangent of the angle is uh, QT over QZ. Um, I don't want to say, and the cosine of the angle, really, I don't care about the tangent, I care about the cosine. No, I guess I already wrote it. The cosine of the angle is the uh, QZ over the magnitude of Q, which for massless particles is QZ over E, right? Which is the same ratio appearing here. And therefore, I can write this as. Um, this is one half, this is say m equals zero. One half log of one plus qz over e, which is cosine theta divided by one minus cosine theta. Um, one plus cosine theta <coughs> is also equal to um, two cosine squared theta over two and one minus cosine theta is equal to two sine squared theta over two. That's just a trig identity. Um, so the twos cancel. Um, the cosine squareds pull out, of, pull out of the log, and we just get uh, this equals to um, the logarithm of the cotangent of theta over two. Right? Um, so we call this, this thing has a name. Let's, we call this the uh, eta, which is called pseudo-rapidity. And what we showed is that uh, y equals eta for m equals zero. So for massless particles, the pseudo-rapidity equals the rapidity. But the pseudo-rapidity is a geometric quantity. It's defined to the scattering angle in the lab frame. So this makes pseudo-rapidity particularly useful for an experiment because they can just talk about, you know, the detector has certain parts that, you know, for example, the tracker goes up to 2.5 in pseudo-rapidity. Um, and that has meaning in terms of particle physics because it corresponds to this rapidity variable, which is boost invariant, um, uh, for massless particles. But it's a more general quantity that, that's useful um, even for massive particles. Um, 
And again, since most particles that we're interested in are effectively massless, it's a very good approximation. Right. So again, rapidity is the thing that's exactly boost invariant. This thing isn't boost invariant because it's just defined in terms of theta, and theta is not boost invariant. Um, however, for massless particles, um, it, it is boost invariant, um, this particular quantity. And again, I, I should say, rapidity itself is not boost invariant. It's only differences in rapidities that are boost invariant. Rapidity shifts under a boost. Um, uh, and differences in rapidities. So differences in angles aren't boost invariant. Um, what do I want to say? So uh, let's just get a sense of what pseudo-rapidity looks like. So pseudo-rapidity is the coordinate that's used to describe detectors. Um, so we talk about, so here, let's just sketch out Atlas. So there's this, so it kind of looks like this, there are these uh, in cap, and there's the barrel, um, and there's the tracker in the middle here, and then there's the ECAL and the HCAL. Um, so rapidity really corresponds to some kind of angle here. So we say this is this is uh, delta eta of around 2.5. So so 2.5 is the number where the majority of the of the things that can be measured, the ECAL and the tracker, generally work down to 2.5. There's things in the forward. There's hydronic calorimetry in the forward region. Um, which is useful for um, precise measurements of missing energy. There's a muon tracker in the forward region and so on because you don't want to lose the muons. Um, but a lot of, the, a lot of the, the meat of what's measured at the LAC is relatively central stuff, which corresponds to delta eta equals 2.5. Um, so you might ask, what angle does that correspond to if we don't know how to think in terms of rapidity? Um, uh, so we can use this formula. So we say eta is 2.5, and we solve for theta, and we get uh, so this angle uh, theta here. Theta is around 10 degrees. So it's actually relatively shallow, right? So it, it has a large extent. 2.5. Well, I, I should say so. This is let's sketch this. This is eta equals zero. This is a you know eta equals one. Eta equals two. And um, eventually, if we take theta, so uh, well, usually we measure theta. So let's let's just look at this formula here. If we take theta equals zero, um, what's the cotangent of zero? You know that infinite zero infinite infinity. Well, if we forget what cotangent is, we can look at this formula. If we take theta equals zero here, we get one over zero, which is infinity. So theta equals zero is infinite. So there's so this is this corresponds to eta equals infinity. This corresponds to eta equals minus infinity, um, or vice versa. I guess the way I drew it, this is minus and plus. Um, so. Rapidity goes from minus infinity to infinity, or pseudo rapidity goes from minus infinity to infinity, corresponding to an angle of theta that goes from zero to pi. Um, we can sort of sketch it. Um, so here's, if I just plot this function eta as a function of theta, um, it looks like. Uh, well, I have two sketches here. I don't remember which is which, but let me draw it like this. Ooh, and draw that very well. Not an X drawing. So this is um, I'm plotting here logarithm of the cotangent of theta over two, um, and this is so this is uh, pi over two. This is zero, and this is pi. So pi over two, the tangent of pi over two. Um, tangent of pi over 2 over 2 is pi over 4, which is 45 degrees, and the tangent of 45 degrees is 1. Um, and so and the logarithm of 1 is 0. So that's this point here. You with me? Um, oh, I'm out of time. Um, let me see if there's a good place to stop. Okay, well, this is as good a place to stop as any. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so basically the way the detector is described, you take the cylinder and you unroll it, and we talk about rapidity and 
we usually draw eta and phi. So phi is this other angle there, phi. So you specify a point, a direction in space. So there's basically you have momentum, and you just need to know if you know it's energy, you need to know where it hits on the cylinder. So you take the cylinder and you unwrap it, and eta equals infinity is over here, and phi goes from zero to two pi up here. Um, and then, and phi, the azimuth angle is of course also boost invariant because it's just in the transverse plane. Um, and the other quantity we talk about is r, which is usually the difference between two particles. We, by that we mean delta phi squared plus delta eta squared. Um, oh, one other thing I need to mention about pseudorapidity, that uh, eta for theta approximately pi over two, that is for central uh, rapidity, then eta is approximately uh, pi over two minus theta. So for most of the central region, it's linear in theta. So it's just exactly the angle. Um, the logarithm only happens when you start getting very large angles. But for central region, it really is just the same radial angle measured in radians. Um, and that's why this definition of phi and theta really is distance along uh, on the sphere in radians, like you would expect. Um, um, and that applies close to the central region, and it's a worse approximation as you get farther away from the central region. Um, but mostly, it's, a, it's an object with the, basically the same measure in the central region as azimuthal angle. That was a question? Well, what most means is when you have these triggers that I was talking about, and all the triggers require high PT. So if you have high transverse momentum, you're much more likely to be central for the same energy than forward. So if you fix the energy, and I also fix the transverse momentum, then I, can't, I don't have much room to have a lot of other energy. Right? So basically, what the, what the reason that we have low energy stuff is because the partner distribution functions want these x's to be very, very small. It's very hard to collide the potato. Into the so the higher the energy it is, the harder it is. Right? And so if you're fixing the PT, then to give it a longitudinal boost as well, you have to give more energy for the same PT. So that's relatively rarer. So for very, very high energy things, they're almost all central, um, very high PT. So uh, uh, one TV jet are all going to be eta of less than 0.2 or something like that. Yeah. Um, and that's why you can focus on the central region. It's also things are better measured there, so we want to focus on it. Even if there were events there, they're not the ones that we're going to measure best. Um, Okay, so we'll stop here. I'll continue some more collider physics stuff next time and then get into um, the standard model um, and QCD.